In this video tutorial, we will discuss the core measures for Stage 2, outlining what needs to be done in clinical in order to achieve each measure. There are now 17 core measures in Stage 2. Most of the measures are similar to what you accomplished in Stage 1, there is only one completely new measure. The Computerized Provider Order Entry, or CPOE measure, has been expanded upon in Stage 2. In Stage 1, it only referenced medications. However, in Stage 2, they changed it to requiring you to electronically document 60% of medications, 30% of laboratory tests, and 30% of radiology orders in the EMR. I'm going to assume that you're already electronically entering your medications, so we will not cover that in today's video. I will, however, show you how to properly document the lab and radiology orders so that you receive credit for this measure. In order for our software to count your orders, you will need to be clicking off your lab and radiology orders in your progress note through a procedure checklist. If you are clicking off orders through our software using a generic checklist, then you will need to modify your template in order to achieve this measure. There are videos on our website outlining this process if you are not familiar with it, or you could have somebody from STI make the changes for you, but it would be a billable task. You will need procedure checklists for this measure, the core lab measure, and also the menu imaging measure. Before you add your procedures to your template, you will first need to make sure the procedure is properly configured. In order for our software to know which tests to count, we must designate that on the properties of the condition. To do so, go to Edit, System Tables, Conditions, Procedures. From within the Procedure dialog, type what you're looking for and highlight the condition once you find it. Then click Properties. From within the Properties dialog, you want to designate the Type field. You would set it to Lab for Labs and Image for Radiology. This is the only configuration that you need for CPOE. However, there are several other measures that deal with orders, and for those measures, you will also need the Track Order configuration turned on as well. So depending on your setup, it might be worth your while to turn that on while you're here setting the type. In addition to those fields, you can also designate where this procedure is performed by using the in-house checkbox. Again, this is not necessarily for CPOE, but will be for other measures. If this order is performed on-site, you would check the box for in-house. If it is performed off-site, you would leave this box unchecked. This configuration determines how the order is reviewed. If the order is designated as in-house, the order is reviewed from the face sheet and an automated chart note is generated once the order is reviewed. If the order is off-site, then it is reviewed from the drop-down at the top of the chart. No auto-generated note is created with off-site orders, since we assume you will probably receive a report from the facility where it was performed. After you've configured the type, you can then add that condition to a template. So now let's get into what we really want to know about this measure, how to get credit for my orders. So let's open up a chart note and take a look. We're going to scroll down to find our procedures ordered checklist, which would look something like this. And I'm just going to click the plus sign next to the procedure that I'd like to order for this patient. From within the Order Procedure dialog, you would fill out any appropriate information. Now, nothing is necessarily required to be entered for this measure, but of course you may have to enter information like diagnoses for other reasons. One thing I did want to mention about this dialog is the checkbox for Initial Order Created Outside of Clinical. You will see this field on this dialog as well as the Medication dialog, and it will serve the same purpose on both. It would be used in a situation where you originally created the order on paper, or maybe over the phone, and then later went into the EMR and added it for proper documentation. If you use this checkbox, you will not receive credit for this order for the CPOE measure. 
we were required to have this functionality for certification purposes. However, we assume it probably won't be used very often. When you are done, you can click OK. You will notice once you click off an order, if you have track order turned on, the order will show automatically on the face sheet. And if we close the chart, we will see the reminder for the order on our to-do list under the orders tab. If you did not turn on track order in the properties of the procedure, then you don't need to worry about those two things as it would not be applicable. So at this point, we've clicked off the properly configured order through a procedure checklist, so our patient will be in the denominator and the numerator for this measure. You will always be at 100% for this measure unless you are using the initial order created outside of clinical checkbox, which I mentioned earlier. So to recap, for stage two, the CPOE measure has been expanded to also include documenting lab and radiology orders along with medications. Clicking off the order through a procedure checklist will put the patient in the denominator and the numerator. Core measure number two is your e-prescribing measure. In stage two, you are required to e-prescribe more than 50% of all permissible prescriptions through the EMR. To achieve this in clinical, you would simply add medications through the medications button while selecting the transmission of ePrescribe. I'm not going to demo an entire example for you in this video. However, I did want to point out that in version 5.2, the prescribe button was renamed to medications. Moving along to core measure number three, the demographics measure. In stage two, you are required to document race, language, ethnicity, gender, and date of birth on more than 80% of all unique patients seen. This can be done in practice manager on the patient tab or in clinical on the ID tab. Core measure number four is the vitals measure. In stage two, you are required to enter vital information on more than 80% of the unique patients seen. This time around though, they have given you several data combination options to allow you to select the most relevant one for your practice. Instead of all three vitals being required for any age, they have broken it down into three different options. Option one is all three vitals, which would include blood pressure for patients age three and older, and height and weight for all ages. Option two is blood pressure only for all patients age three and older, or option three is height and weight for all patients regardless of age. Our dashboard will display all three of these options as separate measures so that you may see your statistics for any scenario. Your provider should select the one scenario that is most relevant to your scope of practice to attest to. Core measure number five is recording the smoking status. In stage two, you are required to document smoking status for more than 80% of patients age 13 and older. Beyond them changing the required percentage, there are no additional changes to this measure. You will use the smoking history button to document this information. Remember, this only needs to be documented one time during the reporting period for each patient. Core measure number six is clinical decision support. In stage two, you are required to implement five clinical decision support rules relevant to your specialty, and those five rules should be related to four or more clinical quality measures if possible. Remember, you set up one rule for stage one so you probably only need to set up four more to meet stage two. To aid in configuring these rules, we have added several pre-configured rules related to CQMs for your convenience. And I'll show you those in a minute, but before I do, I also wanted to mention that there is a second part of this rule, and that is to have your interaction checking turned on. In stage one, this was a separate measure onto itself. It was one of those measures where you didn't necessarily have to do anything with it, since our interaction checking is turned on by default. So in stage two, for whatever reason, they lumped it in with this measure. 
you will see two parts, part A and part B for this measure on your dashboard. Okay, so let's go and take a look at how to create decision support rules. To create a rule, go to Edit, System Tables, DSS Rule Builder. If this option is grayed out for you, that means you do not have the user privilege to create DSS rules. To change this, you would go down to Users, change your configuration, log out and back in, and then you should see the DSS Rule Builder available. Within the DSS Rule Builder, the first addition you will notice is the View Saved Rules area to the right. If you click on the drop-down, you will see a list of any rules you have created, as well as the nine pre-configured rules that are based on CQMs. The names of these rules will always start with CQM and then the NQF number if available. Now, even though we have pre-configured rules, there will still be some manual intervention on your part in order for them to function. There was no way for us to map the data points since everyone's database is different. So to map your data points, you would select the rule from the Save Rules dropdown, then take a look at the rule logic and pick out the data points that need to be defined. They are typically the data points related to diagnoses and or procedures. You will never need to map a data point for something like age or vital signs. Those are system defined. If you are unsure which data points need to be mapped, please reference our user manual as it will have a list for you. In this example, we need to map the diagnoses for pharyngitis and tonsillitis. So from the left, I'll first select Modify, and then select the field that I want to map. In this example, I'm going to find my I9 for pharyngitis. We will need to define I9 and I10 for pharyngitis since they are separate data points. After you select the data point, then search the database for the applicable codes at the bottom. I happen to know the two I9 diagnosis codes that are applicable, so I'm going to search by code instead. Type in the criteria, and highlight the data element once you find it. Then click Add to add it to the linked diagnoses list. You can then repeat those steps as necessary, adding codes. Once you're done defining this data point, you should click Save. Then you're going to go and define your next data point. In our case, it happens to be the I10 for pharyngitis. If you're selecting an I10 code, you will see the screen change slightly. From here, I'm going to search by code. And once the system finds the correct code, I'm going to select Add to Selected Codes. Again, you can repeat those steps if necessary. And once you're done defining this data point, you can click Save. Now, if we were really setting this up, we would continue by defining the data points for tonsillitis, but I'm going to skip over that for sake of time. The last thing that you will have to do when using pre-configured rules is to define the action mapping. The action is the pop-up reminder that you will receive when the patient meets this rule. Start by selecting the rule from the dropdown. If you do not see any applicable recommended actions, click New to add a new one. You'll then receive a free text box to type into. For this example, the rule is going to alert you when you diagnose a patient within the age range with pharyngitis or tonsillitis, but do not have documentation of antibiotics on their chart yet. So your recommendation could be something like wait for results of strep tests before administering antibiotics. Click OK when you're done. Then you'll want to highlight the recommended action and click Add to add it to the mapped recommended actions. At this point, you could continue adding more recommendations if necessary. Otherwise, click Save when you are done. So those are the two things that you will need to do in order to use the pre-configured decision support rules we have added. Define your data points and the action mapping. When you are done, you can click Close to close the Rule Builder dialog. Of course, remember that once you are prompted in a patient's chart about a rule, you must address it, but nothing has changed with that part of the process, so I'm not going to demo that to you in this video. So to recap, for clinical decision support in Stage 2, you will need to set up a total of five rules, 
and the roles you set up need to be related to CQMs that you report on, if possible. Core measure number seven is View, Download, Transmit. For stage two, this measure is a two-part measure. The first part requires that more than 50% of all unique patients seen are provided online access to their health information within four business days. The second part requires that more than 5% of unique patients seen need to view, download, or transmit their health information to a third party. This is a measure where the Chartmaker Patient Portal comes into play. Your patients will use the Patient Portal to access their health information. If the patient is registered on the Patient Portal, upon note signing, their information will be uploaded to the portal automatically. As long as you authorize the patient through Practice Manager and sign your progress note within four business days, you will receive credit for the first part of the measure. The second part of the measure requires the patient to log into their patient portal account and at least view their information. In order to get that to happen, you will need to educate your patients on the importance and basic navigation of the patient portal. So let's start from the beginning. In order for the auto upload of information to the patient portal to occur, you need your patient to be registered. This involves authorizing them through Practice Manager first. In order to authorize a patient, you do need to have an email on file. Then click Patient Portal. And from here, you'll click Authorize. Then click Yes to confirm and OK when you're done. After you click OK and then save on the patient's account, a registration email will be sent to the patient to the email address you have on file. At this point, the patient portal button is yellow. Yellow indicates their registration is still pending, meaning you authorize them, but they haven't completed the registration yet by accessing the email and logging in online. The button will turn green once the patient has completed registration. Now let's look at what the patient will do. The patient will receive an email similar to this. The patient will click on the link from within the email and that will take them to the registration page. On the registration page, they will need to fill out the following information. They'll create a username, which does need to be unique. They will confirm their birthday, which does need to match what you have in clinical and practice manager. Then they will create a password and a security question and answer. The question and answer can be anything that they want to set it to. Then they'll scroll down. They'll accept the terms of use, type in the security characters, and click register. After clicking register, the patient will be a registered patient portal user, and you will receive credit for the first part of the measure. Now that entire process could be done in your office, if you have a computer for the patient to use. In order to receive credit for the second part of this measure, the patient will need to log into their account and at least view their information. So let me show you what that entails. We'll log in as a patient. Once your patient is logged in, they will then need to click on Clinical Summaries or Lab Reports in order for you to receive credit for the second part of this measure. They can also download or transmit their information to another provider using the send a direct message option on the messages page, but simply viewing a clinical summary or lab will suffice. Since the patient needs to view a clinical summary or lab, realistically they will not be able to fulfill this part of the measure until after the provider has signed a progress note. Patients do receive email notifications whenever there has been activity on their account. So to recap, this measure is one of the measures that will require you to get set up with the Chartmaker Patient Portal since you will need to give your patients access to their health information with the ability to view, download, or transmit it to a third party. Authorizing the patient through Practice Manager and signing your progress note within four business days will get you credit for the first part of this measure. The patient logging into the portal and at least viewing their information will get you credit for the second part of this measure. Core measure number eight is clinical summaries. 
in stage two, you are required to provide a clinical summary to 50% of your patients seen within one business day. To generate a clinical summary, you would either click export at the top of the screen after completing and signing your note, or you can go to chart, export, patient data. You must use this option if you are printing the clinical summary on any day other than the office visit in order to receive credit. This dialog has two new options, the option to print previous clinical summaries and the option to change your clinical summary preferences. When you click Previous Summaries, you will see a list of the clinical summaries that have been printed for this patient since upgrading to 5.1. This list will not include the summaries that were printed prior to upgrading to 5.1. If you would like to reprint a summary, you can highlight the summary and click Reprint. When you click Preferences, you will receive this dialog giving you three different options to configure. First is whether you want to display the exclusion dialog when printing or saving a summary. This is a new feature allowing you to exclude information that will show on the clinical summary. If you have this box checked, you will receive an extra pop-up dialog before the summary prints, allowing you to pick items that you do not want to print on the summary. This exclusion dialog will only be displayed when attempting to export the clinical summary using the Chart Export Patient Data option. You will not receive this exclusion dialog when using the export icon. The second preference is similar to the first, allowing you to select whether you see the exclusion dialog, but this time it is relating to when you sign a note for a registered patient portal patient. Remember, when you sign a note for a registered patient portal user, their clinical summary information will automatically be sent to the patient portal. So this option is just allowing you to select which information they may see on the patient portal. The third preference is whether or not you want the sections that do not have any information for that visit to print on the clinical summary. For certification purposes, we were required to output text such as information not applicable to today's visit in any required sections that do not have information. However, we understand that this can clutter up the clinical summary, so we are giving you the option to hide sections that do not have applicable information, if you so choose. All three of these preferences are per user. So let me show you what I mean by the exclusion dialog. I'm going to click Save. Once you click Save or Print, if you have the option turned on to view the exclusion dialog, you will receive this screen. From within this dialog, you will have the option to select which data elements you do not want to print on the summary by checking the box next to that item. If you are fine with everything printing, then just click OK. It will then either print the summary or prompt you to select a location like we are seeing here. One last addition to clinical summaries is the option to document and receive credit for the clinical summary when the patient declines it. So if your patient tells you that they do not want a copy of their clinical summary, you can go to Chart, Export, Patient Declined Clinical Summary. By clicking this option, you will receive credit for the meaningful use measure without actually printing it, as long as you click it within the required time range, of course. Okay, so let's recap. In stage two, you must export the clinical summary within one business day of the office visit. If your patient is registered on the patient portal, you will not even need to physically print it as simply signing your progress note will send the clinical summary to the patient portal automatically, giving you credit for the measure. If the patient is not a registered patient portal user, then you will either need to generate the summary or designate that the patient declined the summary instead. Remember, you can tell whether the patient is registered on the portal by looking at the bottom of their chart at the Patient Portal button. If the button is green, that indicates the patient is registered 
and you do not have to print a clinical summary. If the button is gray or yellow, the patient is not registered and you should physically print the summary. We also added the functionality to allow you to exclude information from being displayed on the summary as well. Core measure number nine is protect electronic health information. This is a measure that requires you to have a manual detailing all that you do to protect patient health information, whether it is written, electronic, or verbal. To attain this measure, you are required to keep this manual up to date, so every year you should be assessing your procedures along with the manual to see if anything needs to be adjusted. Even if you feel that no modifications are necessary, you still need to be completing this process and then updating the copyright date to show that it's been revised. Remember, one of the key requirements to this measure is to perform a security risk analysis. STI can do this for your practice to cover network and hardware assessments. However, this is only one subset of what is required for this measure. This is a measure that comes up often during audits, so please make sure that you've updated your manual and had another security risk analysis performed in 2014. If you are interested in STI performing this analysis, please contact STI Managed Services. Also, there are templates and additional information as to what should be in the manual on our website. Core measure number 10 is incorporating lab results. In stage two, this measure requires that more than 55% of lab order results are incorporated into the EMR as structured data. In stage one, this was a menu measure, so your practice may or may not be doing this already. If you have been doing this measure, please be aware that the steps to receive credit in our software have changed from Stage 1 to Stage 2. In Stage 1, you basically only needed an interface to receive credit. However, in Stage 2, you will be required to do more than that. First, you will need to document your lab orders through a procedure checklist. This will give us a count as to how many labs were ordered. Clicking off the lab in this manner will add an entry into the denominator. Then, once the lab result comes back, you will need to change the order status to completed or reviewed. Changing the order status will add an entry into the numerator, getting you credit for that lab being ordered. Since this process does not account for the requirement to incorporate lab results in the EMR, you have one last step to complete, which is documenting the lab result. And there are two ways for you to accomplish that. You can either incorporate an electronic lab interface or if that is not possible, then you can manually enter the lab result into a note, and that would suffice. Obviously, incorporating the electronic lab interface is easier, so if that is available, we would suggest going that route. If you need information on setting up an interface with your lab vendors, contact Software Support. So let me show you what that entails in the software. Before you can even start entering your lab information, you will need to make some database and template changes. You'll start by checking to make sure that all the lab conditions are designated as such in the database. To do so, go to Edit, System Tables, Conditions, Procedures. From within the search screen, type what you're looking for, highlight the condition once you find it, and click Properties. From within the Properties dialog, you'll want to make sure that you set the Type field to Lab. You will check the box for Track Order. And if you happen to perform the procedure in your office, you can check the In-house checkbox as well. Once you've set the appropriate configurations, you can click Save. And then you would continue and do that for any other condition. Once you've set up your conditions, you can then add them to your template. Now let's look at how to order your labs. So from within a chart note, scroll down to find your orders checklist and click the plus sign next to the applicable lab you'd like to order for this patient. From within the order procedure dialog, fill out any appropriate information. Nothing is necessarily required to be entered for this measure, but of course you may have to enter information like diagnoses for other reasons. Click OK. 
I'm actually going to select another procedure so that I can show you the difference between in-house orders and off-site orders. The lipid panel is set up as an off-site order and the urinalysis is set up as in-house. You will notice once you select the order that it shows automatically on the face sheet. If we close the chart, we will also see the reminder for the order on our to-do list under the orders tab. So at this point, we've clicked off the properly configured lab through a procedure checklist. So our patient will be in the denominator for this measure. In order for the patient to get into the numerator, we need to track the status of the order. To do so, you would open the patient's chart. That can either be done by searching for the patient on the left or by double clicking on the order reminder from your to-do list. If you are changing the status of an off-site order, you will do so from the drop-down at the top of their chart. You will immediately see the status change on the face sheet as well. If you are reviewing an in-house order, that is done from the face sheet by right-clicking on the lab and selecting Review in-house order. You'll select the order status from the bottom document comments and or results if applicable, and then click Save. The reminders on the patient's face sheet and on your to-do list will go away once you change the status of the order to reviewed. So at this point, since we changed the order status, our patient will now be in the numerator. The last thing you will need to do in order to attain this measure is to incorporate the lab results as structured data. If you have an electronic lab interface, no additional steps are required on your part since the results will be incorporated automatically. However, if you do not participate with an electronic lab interface, or if 55% of your labs do not come back through your interface, then you will need to document the lab results manually in a template. STI has created a generic template that you could use and or modify. However, if you need a template created, or if you want this standard template modified and do not have template editing knowledge, STI can do that for you for a fee. So let me show you this template. It will be named MU Lab Results Note. From within, you will see a single link listing some of the most commonly used labs. If you select one of these links, it will display a template with numeric fields applicable to that lab. So when you receive a lab result back, you would open the patient's chart, create a lab results note, and then enter the values for the applicable labs in the numeric fields. As long as your numeric field is linked to a lab condition and your lab condition is linked to an appropriate link code, this will get you credit for having the lab result incorporated as structured data. Remember, this is only necessary if you do not have an electronic lab interface accounting for 55% of your labs. So to recap, for the lab measure, you will need to enter your lab orders through a procedure checklist, mark the lab as completed or reviewed when the results come back, and also have the lab results incorporated as structured data, whether that comes from an electronic interface or someone manually entering the data into your EMR is up to you. Core measure number 11 is generating a patient list. In stage two, this measure is exactly the same as it was in stage one, except now it is a core measure instead of a menu measure. You are required to generate one report listing patients with a specific condition. To do so, you would go to reports, reports. The measure asks for patients with a specific condition. So the only thing that you need to filter your report on is diagnosis. So you would check the box next to with DX or with DX ICD-10, and then select the ellipsis to the right to search for your diagnosis. From within here, you will type the diagnosis you're looking for. Now there are no rules as to what diagnosis to select. It just needs to be relevant to your patient population. So I'm gonna go ahead and search for hypertension. Highlight the diagnosis once you find it and click Add. Then click OK and Run Report. 
You will then see your results display at the bottom. And at this point, you should print the report for your records. To print the report, click Print. To save the report to your computer, click Print to File. You can do either method as long as you have a copy of the report for attestation and or an audit. Core measure number 12 is patient reminders. In stage two, you are required to send a reminder via the patient's preference to more than 10% of unique patients with two or more office visits within the 24 months prior to the beginning of the reporting period. So basically for 2014, let's say you start your reporting period in July, you would need to send appropriate reminders to 10% of your patients that were seen at least twice from July 2012 to July of 2014. In order to perform this function within clinical, you will use the reminder preference and recall functionalities. The reminder preference can be found in Practice Manager on the Patient tab or Clinical on the ID tab. The four options for reminder preference are No Preference, Not Asked, Phone Call, and Postal Mail. In order for you to receive credit for this measure, the method you use to remind the patient needs to match the preference that is set on their chart. If the preference is set to not asked or no preference, then you will always have a match, no matter whether you call them or send them something in the mail. Reminder preference is probably something that you want to start documenting at check-in if you haven't already started to do so. Now let's look at the recall. Recalls can be entered through clinical or practice manager. For a valid recall, all you need to enter is the recall type and a date. Now, in order to receive credit for sending a reminder, you must first send the reminder and then change the reminder method here on the recall. The act of changing the reminder method is what gets you credit in our software and must be done within your reporting period. Changing the reminder method can either be done manually by opening the recall dialog like we are doing here, or the software will change it automatically if you are producing recall letters or labels through Practice Manager. Keep in mind that producing a letter is only fulfilling the reminder for patients that prefer snail mail, so if you have patients that prefer a phone call reminder, then you will need to manually update those patient recalls through this dialog. So to recap, for patient reminders, you will need to start documenting the patient's reminder preference and using the recall functionality. Changing the reminder method on the recall for a patient that was seen at least twice in the past 24 months is what actually gets you credit. This can be done manually in the recall dialog or automatically by generating recall letters or labels through Practice Manager. Moving on to core measure number 13, which is educational resources. For this measure, you are required to provide patient-specific educational resources to 10% of your patients seen. This is accomplished in clinical by using the Education Materials button. If you click Education Materials, you will see the familiar custom-defined list of educational materials that your office distributes at the top. And then at the bottom is an enhancement that we added in 5.1. You will now have the option to access educational materials from Medline Plus, which is a free online library of health information. If you want to use Medline Plus, click the icon. At the top of this dialog, you will notice that the patient's diagnoses, medications, and labs will be displayed, allowing you to click on one of these items to search for quickly. Notice how when I click on hypertension, it loads information regarding high blood pressure at the bottom. And I could click on that topic to receive more information. If you want to give this handout to your patient, you can click Print and Save or Print. The Save option will record that you gave this to the patient. The Print option will obviously print the materials. So if you wanted to document that you gave them the information, but didn't necessarily want to print it right now, 
Maybe you have a printed copy already, or maybe it's available on your patient portal. You could just click Save instead. You can navigate, view, and save different topics without closing this dialog. Let's say I want to search for something that is not on the patient's chart. To do that, I would simply place my cursor in the box next to Search Medline Plus. Then I type what I'm looking for and click Go. You will then see the results appear and you can look through it and determine what might be appropriate for this patient. You can click Save at any point to save the information that you're viewing to the patient's chart. When you are done, you can click Close. You will then see a list of all the information you saved for this patient. If you are done adding educational materials, click OK. In your progress note, any practice-specific materials, meaning the ones you selected from the top of the dialog, will print first, and the materials from Medline Plus will print after that. The Medline Plus materials will always have that designation before the document name so that you know where they originated from. Core measure number 14 is medication reconciliation. You are required to perform medication reconciliation for more than 50% of the patients transitioned into your care. This is accomplished in clinical by using the medication reconciliation button. From within this dialog, you will first need to select why you performed the reconciliation and then document that you actually did the reconciliation. So you will select yes from one of the first three options and then select yes to the last question that you completed the medication reconciliation. Selecting yes to one of the first three options and yes to the last option will get you credit for this measure. You can still use the CPT2 codes However, using this widget is probably easier. Core measure number 15 is transition to care summary. In stage two, this is a three-part measure. First, the EP must provide a transition of care summary for more than 50% of the patients transitioned or referred to another care setting or provider. Second, within that 50%, 10% of those referrals need to be transmitted electronically using a certified method. Clinical will accommodate this process using direct project. The last part of the measure requires your practice to conduct a successful electronic exchange of the transition to care summary with either another practice not using STI's EMR product or using CMS's test validator tool called the EHR randomizer. So let's take a look at what needs to be done for each part of this measure. In order to produce a transition to care summary, open up the patient's chart and go to Chart, Export, Patient Data. If you access this dialog outside of the patient's chart, then you will have to search for the patient first. Then you'll select from the Document to Export dropdown, Transition of Care Summary. Then select the appropriate provider. The provider you select from this dropdown is the one that will receive credit for this measure. Then you would click Save or Print. And that is all that is required in order to receive credit for the first part of the measure. The second part of this measure requires that you send at least 10% of those transition to care summaries electronically. This is done using Direct Project. In clinical, you will go to To Do, Direct Messaging, Send New Message. This dialog only allows you to send a secure message to another party who has a direct address. Direct addresses are different than email. Direct addresses are assigned through your EMR vendor for the purpose of exchanging patient health information through a secure messaging standard and can only be used through an interface capable of supporting direct. If you do not have a direct address yet, you can go to our website to request one. In order to select the recipient of this message, click to. Then type in whatever criteria you would like to search by and click search. Once you find the appropriate recipient, double click on their name to add them to the to field. Once you're done adding recipients, click okay. 
then you can add a subject for your message. You do have the ability to attach items to this message by clicking attach. However, if you are trying to attain the second part of this measure, you need to attach your transition to care summary by clicking generate and attach CDA. After doing so, select your provider. The provider that you select from this dropdown is the one that will receive credit for this transition to care summary. Then click Save. If you have the exclusion dialog turned on, you will receive it at this time. You can select information to be excluded from the summary and or click OK. Then you would select a location to save your file and click Save. Once the export is complete, you will receive a dialog and you will click OK. At this point, you can finish by adding a message and or just clicking Send. You will not receive any confirmation dialogs after clicking Send, but if you want to check which messages have been sent, go to To Do, Direct Messaging, View Sent Messages. This dialog will list all the messages that have been sent for this user and other users in your practice. So at this point, you will have achieved part two of this measure, which was to send your transition to care summary electronically via a certified method. For the third part of the measure, you need to successfully do an exchange with either another practice not using STI's EMR product or using CMS's test validator tool. We suggest that you use CMS's EHR randomizer since it will probably be easier to prove that you've completed this part of the measure. To do so, you would go to ehr-randomizer.nist.gov, register, and follow the steps to submit a file. We do have detailed instructions on our website and in our user manuals of how to do this. Core measure number 16 is submitting immunization data to state registries. In stage two, you are required to submit immunization data on an ongoing basis to your state immunization registry for the entire reporting period. In stage one, all you had to do was send a test file, but in stage two, you need to submit ongoing data. In order to accomplish this measure, you will need to enter your immunizations through clinical, get set up with PC vaccine, and also enroll with your state's immunization registry. If you have not already done so, please contact clinical support and somebody will contact you about getting set up with the state's registry. If you have previously sent a test file with STI's assistance, you are in our queue and somebody from STI will contact you when we are ready to start sending data for each state for 2014. Most states are ready with the 5.2 release However, Pennsylvania's interface will most likely not be ready until August, since it was a more complex bi-directional interface. After an STI representative installs PC vaccine, they will also train you on how to enter immunizations and generate batch files, so I will not cover it in today's video. If you do not administer any immunizations, then you are excluded from this measure. And lastly for the core measures, core measure number 17 is secure electronic messaging. You will be required to receive a secure electronic message from more than 5% of your patients seen during the reporting period. In order to accomplish this, your patients will need to use our Chartmaker patient portal. You will receive credit for this measure when your patients send you a message through the patient portal. Only message types of refill requests and health question will count towards this measure. So let's log into the patient portal to see what this means. Once the patient is logged in, they will click Messages and then send a message from the left. They will then see five different types of messages that they can send. Only refill request and health question will get you credit for this measure, so the patient would need to select one of those two. Once the patient selects a type of message, they will receive this dialog. This dialog is the same for every message type. 
From here, they'll first select the provider that they normally see. The provider that they select from this dropdown is the one that will receive credit for this message. They can then type in their phone number to be contacted at and their message. Then they would click send. And that is all that is required for your patient to do in order for you to receive credit for this measure. Your office doesn't even need to necessarily address the message. The patient just needs to send you one. However, let me show you what the message will look like on your side. When a patient sends a message via the patient portal, it will show up on the to-do list for the users configured to receive it. This is defined through distribution lists in the messaging dialog. So here is my message from Teresa. As you can see, it does tell you that it's a message from the portal, that it's a health question, and which patient it is from. If you double click on the message, you will be able to read the message and take any necessary actions such as replying, printing, or deleting. You will also have the ability to save it as a chart note by clicking yes and sign, and then save. So to recap, for the secure electronic messaging measure, more than 5% of the patients you see within your reporting period will need to send you a message through the patient portal using the message type of either refill request or health question. Please be aware that you need to be on a version of 5.1 or higher for your entire reporting period before you can attest for meaningful use this year. 5.3 is our current version and it is currently available through our website. If you have any questions, please contact clinical support.